Good afternoon, everyone. So glad you could be here for our kind of overview of our single family rental fund. We've had a lot of people asking about it. It is still open for investment. We've had a lot of questions about that as well. So we're gonna go over uh, the fund towards the end, but in the beginning, we're just gonna get you super excited about the Texas area, uh, especially at a time when there's a lot of fear and where do I put my money and where is it safe? And my goal by the end of this webinar is for you to, to really feel confidence that there are still places that work. <laughs> you know, there's still places that work like most of our teams, um, you know, have niches, niches is a better way to say that. Uh, they have, uh, you know, strong markets and then niches within that market. And that's what we're, you know, going to be going over today. So this is the Real Income Properties Texas 1 LLC Fund. It is our single family rental fund in the North Texas area. And Leah Slaughter is joining us today. Hey, Leah. Hey, Kathy. I know a lot of you have uh, already, uh, you know, met her. It, it, she is obviously a provider for many of our members at Real Wealth who want to buy property to build your portfolio. And she's also doing this fund, which is a little bit different. It's not competing with what we're already doing. It's it's different and that's what makes it exciting. So the legal disclaimer, you guys have seen this. This is not a solicitation of an offer to purchase securities. That offer is through the PPM, the Private Placement Memorandum. And you can download that at growdevelopments.com. It is our syndication website, growdevelopments.com. If you click on the Invest Now tab, you'll be able to get access to this particular um, you know, fund that we're excited about. Of course, always, always talk to your CPA and your attorney before investing in anything and definitely in a syndication because the taxes are, are going to affect you differently than they might somebody else. So you just really need to understand if this works with your goals and your um, you know, current situation. And then of course, past performance is no guarantee of the future. Uh, we have a lot of excitement about what's happening in the future in Texas, but you know, anything could happen, right? There could be a massive meteor that comes out of the sky and blows up the whole area. So, you know, we could, we just, uh, we have, we make every effort to, maintain accurate and current information and of course the possibility of error always exists okay so we're going to first introduce leah and again i know a lot of you already know her she's done a few webinars just recently uh she and michael and we'll do a market update look at the current assets that the fund owns which is really the exciting part because We've, we, I will say, <laughs> I'll take credit, but <laughs> Leah, Leah and her team have um, exceeded what we thought and what we projected. We were ridiculously conservative in the underwriting of this for good reason. We were going into very uncertain times, very uncertain. We started this, you know, last summer, um, launched it last fall. Uh, so, you know, there's always a lot of unknowns, but there were enough knowns that we went for it. And again, um, you know, have managed to exceed our projections. We'll talk about the fund details and how you can subscribe if you're interested. But first, I don't want to get anybody excited if you don't qualify to be an investor in this fund. It is for accredited investors only, which means that you would have a net worth of a million dollars excluding your primary residence. There are ways around that. By the way, you can get an equity line and take the money out and have it seasoned for a few months and then it can it can count, of course, make sure you look that up on the SEC website. Um, income over 200,000 individually or 300,000 with a spouse or partner in each of the prior two years. And re you reasonably expect the same for this year. And then investment professionals, this is kind of new-ish. In good standing, holding the General Securities Representative License Series 7 or the Series 65 or Series 82, you qualify as a accredited investor. So a really good reason to go take that test, although I'm sure it's not the easiest test to take. All right, uh, uh, Leah Slaughter again, so many of you know her. She, her company is highlighted on our website at realwealth.com uh, as one of our property providers. She is born and raised in DFW. She knows the area very well. She talks like a Texan, as you will see. Uh, been a property manager since 2006. 
we've known her since, I don't know, 2011, I think, something like that. Yeah. Uh, she has four adopted children, uh, does a lot of work in her community. It's really, they're just really fascinating people. Uh, involved in a lot of nonprofit agencies. Uh, Leah and Michael are speakers, educators, and they now have a radio show. And they've invited me to be on it a few times. I hope to be on it again. It's great in the Dallas area. And uh, here's the big one. They own about $40 million in real estate. So uh, she knows the area for so many reasons. One, because property manager in the area really, really understands the rental demand. And then, of course, owns personally quite a lot, quite a large portfolio. So, uh, you know, Leo, I'll kind of hand this to you because you provided this slide. And, uh, you know, we obviously we both agree that real estate is one of the best ways to build wealth, especially in uncertain times. But the purchasing power of the dollar, look at that, very depressing. And <laughs> it's probably much worse now. Yeah, you know, it's funny. You always grow up. My I, I have much, much older parents. And so I, I grew up hearing how cheap things were when they were growing up. And I mean, this is really what we're talking about here, right? The dollar has just continued to plummet. And this is kind of what you expect when you especially come off a gold standard. And, and that's a whole conversation for a different day. But on the right here, what I really want you to look at is the complete opposite inversion of this for U.S. home prices. And so what this really tells us is that cash in a bank is constantly losing value and really in reality, what real estate continues to do is go up. And one of the things I'm going to show you in a little bit is historically what real estate does across the last 80 some odd years. Because at the end of the day, real estate has proven to be one of the safest forms of investment and traditionally does very well during recessions, of course, with the exception of the Great Recession. So we'll talk about that as well. But we also wanted to share that it's not all real estate. <laughs> so <laughs> real estate that is more tied to adjustable rates, like commercial properties, are generally adjustable. They are facing some severe challenges today with rates having gone up from you know, I think they it was that people were paying like three percent and now it's now eight, nine percent on the on the loans that they have because they're consistently adjusting. So of course we know that office is just getting hammered right now because they have to deal with the higher interest rates, but also massive vacancies and uh, just in, and then all the retail around those commercial build, around those offices that are sitting empty is really going to be challenged too. So, you know, when we say real estate, that's a very broad term, but we're, we want to be more specific on that. We're not talking about commercial or, or real estate on more adjustable loans. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's about having an asset that's needed no matter what. And I've always been very against large multifamily commercial. Those of you that have been listening to me for the last 10 years, you know that. And so in reality, what we're seeing right now is just precisely why I'm not a fan of it. It's volatile. Uh, it's very cyclical, it's not consistent, and that's because not everybody has to have an office. And in reality, the more that things increase on this digital side, as we've seen so many changes the last 10, 20 years, and I think now with the invention of AI, it's gonna just intensify like crazy. Uh, we're gonna see a completely different dynamic. You can live and work anywhere in the world. And that's just not because of COVID, but COVID was just kind of a catalyst to spur that into action. So I think this is only gonna get worse. Yeah. And then if you want to go on YouTube, uh, I don't know, they take weird pictures these days for YouTube, but um, this is my on the market most recent video. And I interviewed, it was really interesting. I was at um, our last tour and event in Dallas with you. And at the same time, I was running across town to the multifamily conference that, that I had tickets to. And I interviewed both sides and I put it in this YouTube video. If you want to check it out, it just came out, I think today. Uh, just talking about the difference in, in conversations of the multifamily investors who are really freaking out as they should because their you know their their loan costs have gone up so dramatically they just simply can't pay them and uh, and and they're starting to go into foreclosure and definitely into stress and then I would go over to the single family rental conference uh, that you were hosting and then the tour. And there was not that same stress. The, the sentiment was completely different because most people are on fixed rate loans and are uh, not experiencing the same issues that commercial is experiencing. So. I was on stages last year and they were saying to buy with zero caps and no cash flow because the appreciation and you know values based on income. And 
you know, it, if you have to make numbers work, if they don't work on their own, that's usually, usually a red flag. But yeah, it's a completely different sentiment. I spoke at a panel a few weeks ago and everyone on stage with me. So I led the panel. Every other multifamily provider on stage had started other companies to try to make money right now because no one's doing deals or very few. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tough. So uh, we're focusing, of course, on single family. You get direct control. You have multiple exits. It's easy to leverage. Um, low exposure per property, and you can diversify more. So, you know, this is just our asset class of choice. And um, why did it just do that? Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay. And there's so little supply of it. Now, this is more of a national slide, but you can see uh, housing demand. This is household formation, the green line, and residential completions. So housing demand versus supply just nationwide. You know, I talked to, we have 15 teams we talked to nationwide and they're all experiencing this. There's probably pockets in the world and in the U.S. where uh, maybe there's enough inventory or just not enough demand. People are leaving <laughs> California, <laughs> San Francisco. Uh, but for the most part, there's a 6.8 million uh, shortfall of, of new building here. Anything you want to say about this slide? Uh, I'll hold my commentary till we get to North Texas, because when I show you the numbers in North Texas, uh, you'll see really what's going on. And this yeah. year is looking at that this is this is not new. A lot of people think the housing shortage came about from COVID. That's not accurate. It did make it worse, certainly, but this has been going on for the last 50 years. And so if you look at affordable new entry level homes, so we're talking sub 1400 square feet, uh, this is the percentage and the numbers of those being built. And as you can see, it's just plummeted. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's been a little freaky. There we go. So we will now, now we'll talk about the North Texas market because I know many of you know that we're constantly looking for pockets in the country where they're not known yet. Of course, I keep talking about it. So it's getting more known. Uh, but that where there's job growth, population growth, but it's still affordable. These to me are the opportunity areas because prices haven't gone up yet. But you know it's going to. If that many people are coming to the area because this many jobs are coming, it's going to affect the housing in the area. So let's just talk about how fast Texas is growing. We we know California has the biggest state with 39 million people, and Texas is right behind it with 29 million. Then Florida and New York. And I like to point out, we're about 35% larger than Florida. A lot of people think that we're the same size or we're close in size, but there's no comparison. Okay. Um, and then North Texas population growth is extreme, almost like seriously concerning, like how you're gonna build enough to, to keep up with this demand. Yeah, so we've grown about 25% since 2010. Most of the areas that we work uh, grown about 10% just since the pandemic. We are currently the fourth largest metro in the United States, which if you haven't heard me speak, you may not know that. We're, we're kind of the underdog. We do it quietly at night, but we're saying uh, by 2030s, we'll be the third largest, which means that only New York and LA. So right now, Chicago's in, in place three. And I want you to kind of keep that in mind as we talk, because I want you to think about the average home prices in your other top five, top 10 markets, as I'm talking about the prices of what we're looking at here. Okay, so these are just we're gonna go through this pretty quickly because I don't think we have to sell anybody so much on Texas. Everybody knows what's happening there, but uh, the 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 numbers always blow me away whenever I look at this presentation. It's already home to 7.8 million people, but by 2045 that number could increase by 3.4 million, according to forecasts from JLL. So the the growth is just not slowing down. More than 20% of DFW's employment it came from trade, transportation, utilities, and more than 18% from professional and business service. So a very diversified area as well. So even though economists have predicted a looming recession, DFW appears to be positioned to weather that storm well and recover more quickly thanks to consistent job growth and again, the, uh, the diversity of jobs. And we were the first to recover in COVID and we're currently 10% above COVID numbers. So it's not just something that's happening right now. We have consistently been outperforming everywhere else. 
The economy is on fire. Texas adds adds 650,000 jobs in 2022. 280,000 of those were just here in North Texas, 285 approximate. Incredible. <clears throat> Texas led the country in new jobs in 2020 as states' unemployment rates fell below 4%. So look at that. Texas on top, number one above California. And yet the cost of living is so much lower. And this is where they're coming from. I think this is a really cool slide. They're just kind of coming from everywhere. You know, in, in most of uh, our presentations, I'll say, oh, you know, they're they're mostly coming from, you know, California, but that's just so wrong. They're, I didn't realize how many coming were coming from the Northeast as well. Yeah, and we have the second highest number of tech jobs added in the last eight years. And so what a lot of people don't realize is the pay and the caliber of these jobs coming here. 49.27% of the jobs coming pay more than 150,000 a year and less than 17% earn less than 75,000 a year. So massive incomes here for North Texas. Yep, and there it is <laughs> from the Houston Business Journal. Okay, and so all of that, all those new jobs is bringing in people, 360 people a day between 2010 and 2020. Uh, again, 11.3 million anticipated by 2045. So I just, you know, when we started investing in Dallas, it was right around here. And I, I just did not predict this. I thought, it, you know, it would kind of level out and that has not happened. Okay. All right, let's talk about housing supply. So the news loves to say housing's up 150%, and that's true from COVID days, but what they don't tell you is we are still massively down. So I figured I would just put this here because it kind of speaks for itself. If you take a look at the housing supply in 2023, as opposed to say 2019, where we're less than half. And so it's just, it's a very, very critical time right now. So there's less than one single family permit issued for every five jobs that's moving here. And you can see the number of permits. We're talking 46,875 some of permits, but we added over 285,000 jobs. Uh, and of course, we went into all of this with a housing shortage of about 85,000 homes. And so we are compounding the problem. And then you look at the number of permits that are actually happening right now in 2023 and end of 22, as opposed to 21 and 20, we're way down there too. So it's just getting worse. And of course, supply and demand is simple economics. What happens when there's not enough supply? prices go up. And so I like to call this a pause right now because interest rates have been up. I know there's been quite a bit of relief today since the Fed raised yesterday. So that's exciting. We all kind of expected they were going to raise a little bit and investors like that and rates come down. So the slightest ease of interest rates and you're going to start to see things change. And so that's that's really what we're waiting for in this pause. Yeah. Hopefully this is the last uh, rate hike. Uh, we'll see. But I, I think it will be. I think when the numbers come out in a few days, you're probably right. Yeah, yeah. Fingers crossed. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so yeah, it's all and like you said, you were already in a housing shortage before all these new jobs came in. I think yeah, you so mentioned we're down about thirty-four percent in the number of homes being constructed right now. Uh, so we're down about 16, 17 percent from 2021 into 2022 to 23. So again, we, we grew our population over 21 percent in that time period, but housing only grew 15.9 percent and we were building more than we are now. So just very scary numbers if you're someone who lives here and you have kids here and trying to figure out how and where they're going to be able to afford housing. And, you know, the problem's only going to compound over the next few years. And of course, we are targeting areas where a lot of these jobs are coming in. So it's even worse in those areas because there's so many jobs coming in. If you're in the city of Dallas, it's not as bad as if you're in the suburbs. About 75% of the relocations here are coming to the suburbs. In fact, that three and a half million number of people coming here, for example, only three quarters of a million of those are going into Dallas. So most of it's like Holland County, the Plano, Frisco, all that area you see on the news, that's going to equate to about a million and a half of those people. Yeah, and Dallas Center has gotten so expensive anyway. It's like nobody can live there unless yeah. they're high paying. Okay, so... Uh, DFW today's built environment will change dramatically with a forecasted with from our forecasted growth. So again, single family units 927,000 needed and multifamily 618,000, industrial 309 million. So all of this is needed to keep up with the growth that is expected by 2020 2045. 
Um, Dallas Fort Worth surpasses Austin as Texas's tightest major housing mar market. And a huge number of renters means lots of inventory needed because most of these people aren't probably going to be buying, especially if they're just relocating and checking out the area uh, they would rent before they buy or may not want to buy. And these numbers so, are from before everything happened with interest rates. So we all expect these numbers are significantly higher now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is kind of insider information, I guess, because a lot of people don't really... Uh, realize that with North Texas, I mean, right now you can fly into DFW or to Dallas Love, and Dallas Love is kind of downtown, DFW is out a little bit, but a lot of this growth is happening, what would you say, like an hour from from there? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, th there, this new airport is going to solve the problem of, you know, people having to to drive so far to the airport. Tell me a little bit more about what's happening in McKinney and, and the airport. And it sounds like you just bought your house right next to this. So <laughs> you no, better like I'm airplanes. Three miles, y'all. Three miles. <laughs> um, so actually, they already have enough runway to support it. They're just looking for the new terminal. And then they can do their partnership. So there's a bond out right now. Uh, we suspect that it's going to pass. But even if it doesn't, I think McKinney's likely going to make it happen with cash either way. And so really what we're talking about is another love field. That's essentially what they're shooting for. Wow. And, and about how far is McKinney from Sherman? About 35 minutes. 35 minutes. So yeah. otherwise it would be a long haul. Yeah, well, I mean, and they've got a lot of other things happening too. And so what they're trying to do is interconnect this area where all the tech jobs are coming in. And you've got a lot of uh, very, very expensive flights coming in and private jets. And so they're already using McKinney. What they're trying to do is get commuter flights in. And so what they're doing is the Collin County Outer Loop. So this, this kind of shows you McKinney's proximity to Sherman, Denison, Durant, and where they're trying to service. So you can see all of the areas that you hear me talk about. That's what this airport is designed to service. And then if you go to the next slide, you're going to see some of the interconnection with the highways of what they're developing right now out there so that you can see the interconnection to these areas. So you've got the 380 bypass. You've got the spur 399 to open up these northern suburbs. And then if you go one more slide, you're going to see the Collin County Outer Loop, which is the newest tollway coming in. That's essentially going to connect all of these northern suburbs that currently only have highways running north-south. So it's going to take areas that right now feel an extra 20 minutes out to make them where they're right there because you could just hop on those tollways and go 7580 because that's what they're designed to do. And so, uh, again, one of the things that Dallas does great is interconnecting our suburbs. It's one of the reasons our prices have artificially remained lower than they should be for our size market. And it's also a reason why most of our employers are going to the suburbs. And so we don't have to deal in the city. We don't have to buy those houses in the city and deal with all the nuances that come from inner cities. And so uh, this, this right here is really what makes everything possible. Okay. So here's the latest update on, on inventory levels and, and pricing. Yep, so our inventory levels continue to drop. We're down to about 2.1 months. Uh, some of our big suburbs we talk about, like Collin County, uh, they're down to 1.7, 1.8 months. So again, not a healthy market whatsoever. Five to six months is a healthy market. Home sales price per foot is up about 45% in the last three years. Our median home price across DFW is still only 390,000. So remember that number I told you to be thinking about what's your average home price in LA and Chicago and New York. Uh, our hottest county, Collin County, where all your elites are going, uh, still only 575 average home price. Rental home days on markets lower than January 2020 before COVID. Rent growth of 64% in the last decade, 21% in just the last 24 months. We're up 1% to 2% in the last month in most areas. Uh, as I mentioned, Collin and Dallas County inventory has dropped significantly. 19% of our sales are over list price. We're already seeing multiple offers again. The market's starting to go crazy again. And then uh, 27 average days, depending, and a 98.5 average sale to list ratio. So numbers are very good and it's only improving. Again, rates are easing. And so the more that that happens, the more that we're going to get back into that crazy climate that we had last year. Because you can't get rid of this housing supply shortage. You can't get rid of all these people with cash coming from much more expensive markets who sold homes. All that you can do is manage it until such time as they become buyers again. Yeah, <clears throat> the 10-year treasury dropped again today as investors fear, you know, that they're, the more that the Fed raises rates, the more likely we're going into recession. So the 10-year is down, and usually that means mortgage rates are, will be down as well. And we know what that means to real estate. Yeah. 
And then this just shows you these growth patterns. So the darker the color, the more people are moving there. And so you'll see that the majority of this growth is happening in those outer suburbs. And that's because they're more desirable, they're easier to get to, it's lower cost of living. There's a lot of reasons. Yeah, somebody was saying they're really active in the south of Dallas. I, I don't know much about that area, but it does look like that's growing too. Yep, so we sell down there too. Uh, the difference is it's not the same level of growth because there's not the same percentage of jobs. One of the things that I love about Grayson County and these areas that we're talking about is the percentage of jobs to population. So all, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, but Sherman, for example, is 45,000 people and there's tens of thousands of jobs that have been created and all of this coming in with all these employers. And so that ratio that we're looking for is just astronomical in these areas we're talking about. Yeah, there are small towns that are about to not be small anymore. Yes. It's kind of sad, really. All right, and this is why North Texas is the country's new semiconductor manufacturing capital. Uh, last November, Texas Instruments announced that it would build a $30 billion, 4.7 million square foot semiconductor fabrication plant in Sherman. Uh, we, and then just a month later, uh, global semiconductor manufacturer Globotech awarded its 5 billion 1500 job project to Sherman. It is this little bitty town that's so cute. Was it Sherman where I left my purse on the on the uh, Tennyson? Yeah, just Tennyson. North. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. On the on the public park bench on the main street, I left my purse and we drove off and came back. I don't know, like an hour later, and it was still sitting there. Yeah. Sweet little town is about to transform. Yeah, and so this. This project here with TI is actually the single largest economic deal in Texas history under the Enterprise Fund. If you're not familiar with the Enterprise Fund, Google it. You'll find everything you need to know. A huge majority of the Enterprise Fund dollars are happening here in North Texas, and now Texas is uh, really just increasing what they're doing. And so a lot of these employers you see relocated, even when you see stuff like Liberty Mutual, State Farm, Toyota, uh, this is how they're incentivizing them. It's tax breaks, incentives, not only from the nationwide level, but also the city school taxes, the cities, the counties. It's everyone working together to get these employers here. Yeah. <clears throat> Texas looks to pass on its own CHIPS Act. Well, we know that it's it's the federal government that passed the CHIPS Act to, to incentivize companies to bring the manufacturing back to the U.S. for chip manufacturing. But what does this mean? What's Texas looking to do? So one thing I will point out is that the, the U.S. Act that passed was really after all of this. And so we haven't even seen the huge benefits that are going to come from that to these areas. These relocations are 40 year plans. So their initial commitment is just the start. It's just the tip of the iceberg. So what Texas wants to do is add to the nationwide funds and get even more of them coming here because we've got the new Silicon Valley. They're calling it Silicon Alley or Silicon Prairie. It's been coined both ways. I like Silicon Alley, but- um, <laughs> I think it what, sounds better. Yeah, yeah. But what they're going to do is add Texas money to it and Texas incentives to get them to keep coming and do more and more development here. And we're excited now. Finisar, which is now IVII, uh, they are doing an expansion as well. They just submitted their request for an expansion. So your other huge relocation growth that's happened here is also now expanding. So they do all of your Face ID technology for Apple and all that um, radar technology and laser technology. So again, 45,000 person town is just exploding. And so, you know, these jobs are high paying jobs and those are the types of houses that we wanna be providing for that type of caliber tenant. And you are, you just got another one today. I, I secured one today for $50,000. <laughs> what, what kind of shape is that one in for 50,000? It, it needs a rehab, but it's a two bedroom, one bath, super cute. I actually own the house two doors down because again, I, I own tons in these same areas. And she had it at 80 and I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sick this week. I'm not buying for a couple of days. And she's like, how about 50? I'm like, <laughs> All right, I'm not that sick. <laughs> well, that was a big movement from 80 to my goodness. Okay, yeah. these are the kind of things we're getting in this area, is specifically in this area where everything's growing so much. It's insane. Yeah, and I do want to, oh, go ahead. Two weeks ago. So we got two for 62,000. I think we did one for 75,000. And it's just, it's incredible, but it's because people can't do hard money right now. It's too expensive. So all the other people that buy alongside us, they're out. They can't take 15% rates. And so we've got this unique window of opportunity. And so I'm, everything happens for a reason. The timing was just perfect. And when you say that's like renovation rates, like hard yeah. money is 15%. Yeah, so like someone like me, we can either go direct to a bank, you know, 
the one thing about money is the more you have of it, the better financing terms you get. And so the more successful you become, the more advantageous it is lending with you. Uh, for someone who's just getting started out, which is most of your flippers in these types of areas, they have to go get what is called a hard money loan or an investment loan to do it. And it's very, very risky. And so the rates are astronomical. And right now it's just too expensive. You just can't do it. Some of those hard money loans are 16, 18, 20% and people can't afford that. And so, and, and the other thing is there's a huge labor shortage right now. I mean, there's more jobs than people to work them. And so we have our crews and our same people and they only work with us. Most people don't have that. I've spent almost 20 years building that. And so I can buy a property, throw a crew on it. Other people, they're scrambling on Facebook to try to find crews and then they get you know, taken advantage of or contractors, they're good till they're not. And so it, it's not just about having these people coming to me directly with deals, but having the connections to put the whole thing together. Yeah, and I do want to reiterate that you don't you don't do this uh, for individuals. You're only doing this model for the fund because there's there's risk involved, right? Yeah, and it's a lot of moving parts, and it's not something that someone who hasn't been doing this and doesn't, you know, I can walk in a house and to the five thousand say exactly what it's going to cost to renovate it, and that's not something that you know I could ever do for a client. Yeah, so uh, these are the kind. This is what's exciting about the fund is you're only going to get that kind of deal through the fund. Because we've we've done this model in the past where an investor would buy it and then hire the team to do the renovation and then there'd be a surprise because there often is and you know it might cost more to get it fixed and the investor freaks out and so forth so we just don't do that model um, the the property has to be already rentable and uh, and so you know to be able to invest alongside you in this kind of scenario is is what the fund you know the, the opportunity that we get here. Okay, the new TI semiconductor wafer plant. So we already talked about this one. Yeah, I was just wanted you guys to see what it looks like. It's massive. We were out there the other day. I think there's 17 cranes. It this this does not even do it justice. It's minutes of driving. It's crazy. It's not the one that we drove to see because that wasn't that TI. It is. That was TI. Well, so TI is right next door to Finisar and Globotech. They're all right together and they're mm -hmm. all expanding. So Globotech just submitted and they're doing a multi-million dollar uh, change too. So I think their campus is like 72 acres. They all have, it's massive amounts of land. Yeah. And it's the water. We've got, we've got tons of natural resources here. And so it's, it actually takes a ton of water to create chips. And it's one of the reasons why it's been really hard to do in the U.S. and why certainly California hasn't. And so anyway, that's one of the main drivers that brought them here is our aquifers. Oh, interesting. Okay. And then you talked about Finisar. When you, when you watch this in the recording, you could go through <laughs> all of these line items. We just wanted to make sure that all the data was there, but I think you get the idea. There's just massive growth. Semiconductor plants propel Sherman into a high-tech future. One of the things that you had said is that uh, when you've got these giants coming in, you're going to see a lot of smaller companies coming in to be near, just like Silicon Valley. Yep, proximity. So we are just getting started. And again, we have not even seen the effect of the CHIPS Act yet. I can't even imagine what's coming next. From what yeah. I've been told from people inside TI, and again, this is all hearsay, I've been told this is just the tip of the iceberg. Wow. Okay, well, the city has built a new high school with facilities designed to prepare students for STEM careers, including at places like Texas Instruments. I'd love to see that. So, you know, going into these small towns where the locals may not be the ones who get hired, right, because they don't have the qualifications. They're bringing in people from, from other high-tech areas, but that will change with these, uh, univers with these schools. And then the University of Texas at Dallas has a North Texas Semiconductor Institute. So they're they're training the locals how to get the jobs that are that are coming. All right, so the home values in Sherman as a result, <laughs> this is what it looks like. Um, one year price change is up $47,000, which is very close to the price you just paid for the whole house. <laughs> <laughs> Five-year price change up 123,000, and a typical home value is 271,000. So, with the one you bought today, that's 50,000. What do you think the ARV is? You know, once you're done, what's the yeah, value so once you're done? 165, 170 for a renovated two-bedroom. This one's about 1,300 square feet, so it's a big house, and we'll probably spend 45 to 50 renovating it. So even with a couple months for renovation, we're in it for say 105, 110. And I mean, the numbers speak for themselves. So again, we were very conservative in our projections and we even, we projected everything with cash purchase. So we haven't even factored in the gain and the benefit of leveraging 
And again, it's because of the time that we were in. You and I discussed that we wanted to make sure that we were extremely conservative because we didn't know how high rates were going to go and what the effect was going to be. And um, certainly, I'm very excited with what we've been able to put in the fund. I, I never could have imagined that there would be this many people on the sidelines because, again, you can date the rate and marry the house, but people don't understand economics. So we don't do a good job of educating people in economics. And so, uh, they get their education from the news and they talk about the nationwide market, which you and I both know there is no nationwide market. There's hyper local markets. Yep. And then Denison home values have gone up there as well. Similarly, and these are the two focuses, total employment by industry in Sherman and Denison. Yeah, very, diverse. very, very diverse. And this is one of the reasons I wanted to put this up here. It looks almost identical to Dallas. A lot of people think that, well, all these tech jobs, what happens if the tech sector drops? Well, they have a lot of industry that's not just tech. There are employers all up and down 75 as far as the eye can see. And right now, we already have six times the national average in manufacturing jobs before all these new additions. So there's Tyson Foods. There's all sorts of stuff up in Sherman and Denison. It's incredible. Well, <laughs> with AI coming out, I think we're at the beginning of the technology oh. revolution, not at the end. That's, That's a be... whole different conversation for another yeah. day. <laughs> Ooh, all right. Huge shortage of entry-level homes in Grayson County, just like everywhere else. Mm -hmm. But you can see one bedroom way down, uh, two bedrooms a little bit better. But These are mostly mine. I buy almost all exclusively two bedrooms, so I can tell you a vast majority of those are mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, and now the funds too. <laughs> Why do you like the two bedrooms? Because there's not as much competition. Yes, and because why would you go to an apartment when I can give you a two bedroom home for the same amount of money? And so you pick up a lot of investors, they have this rule in their head, it has to be a three two. And so I could swoop in and do these two twos and two ones and almost no competition. And actually I find the numbers are better because we get such good deals. So I love them. So this is what we've got in the fund so far, 19 properties, 18 single family, one multi, uh, nine in Sherman, one duplex in Sherman, one single in Farmersville, five in Denison, one in Gainesville, uh, like another one in Gain oh in Greenville, and then Leonard, and then cur current rehab status six in process. And those all just closed. So all the ones we closed originally, rehab is done and they're already occupied. We have one that is finishing tomorrow, and then we've got the new batch that just started, and some of them are already halfway done in just two weeks. So we're moving quick. Yeah. And honestly, you know, one of the risk factors that we had is like, is Leah going to be able to find what fits our buy box? And it's like more than is she fine? She could, she could, if we raised $10 million tomorrow, you'd probably find a way to spend it with the deals that are out there. So we, we expect to grow this quite a lot. Yes, I'm very excited. We actually, we got a package of ones that were mostly renovated for an average price of like 160,000 for three twos. I mean, just incredible deals out there. But again, it was all about the timing. Yep. Uh, so this is the periodic report to private placement memorandum. Anything you want to share on here? It's just some of the properties, property details. Yeah, I mean, really, the, the couple things I'll point out is we blew our rent projections on almost every single one that we renovated. We got more rent than projected. Uh, one of them, we got almost $200 more than even I projected. And again, that goes back to housing shortage. And I just love the diversity of the portfolio that we've got. We've got a little bit of everything. We've got a lot of three bedrooms, which are hard to find. A lot of homes with garages, also hard to find. And a little bit of everywhere. Uh, like the Farmersville one that I got in Collin County, I, we were under 200,000 and it's almost 2,000 square feet, incredible house. We've just, we've put together an incredible portfolio and we're just getting started. We're like five and a half months in and we've already done all of this, including raise. So very exciting. Awesome. All right, here's some photos. This is in Sherman to give an idea of what the renovation looks like. Yeah. Now the yellow and blue door, is that typical for the area? No, actually the seller did this and they were in great shape and they rented really, really well. And so we kept them. Okay. Yeah. And they're super cute. I mean, these went so quick. This is one, this is the one that's finishing just now, already tenant moved in. 
We literally were having these leased while they're still in renovation. So we're like all down to the wire. I had guys on overtime out there finishing this one the night before move in. Uh, this is actually a 322 in the heart of Sherman, right by all of the employers. And you and I bought this the day that we made minimum raise. And I picked up this house for like 120,000 uh, pre renovation. And then we came in under budget on the renovation. So again, we've just, we've been very, very uh, happy and lucky with what we've, what we've acquired. And these are just more of the single families. These are all tenant occupied. Okay, so the details on the fund, uh, the, here's the business plan. Again, we pretty much shared it. Acquire one to four unit properties, renovate with high-end finishes to attract some of these uh, $100,000, $150,000 workers who wanna be near, near work, but not in an apartment. Um, <clears throat> at least to, again, highly paid professionals in the growing area. The target return is 8%. We really beat down Leah on this and I'm <laughs> sorry, but I was like, I've done enough syndications where, you know, projections, we didn't, we didn't meet projections and, you know, market, there's been market changes, massive market changes. It's been very difficult to do new construction during COVID. Uh, our new construction projects just have been hit hard by the lack of ability to find materials, labor, uh, now interest rates, it's it's tough. So in this case, I was like, I want to under promise, under promise. What what do we think we can do with your hands tied behind you and you know blindfold? <laughs> so <laughs> this is it. Um, the target annual return of eight percent over a three to seven year hold, and you know that's really a big spread, and I, I get that. Uh, but we I wanted to leave it up to Leah. She's got such a sense of the the market. But if that airport comes in and these properties have gone up so much in value that it makes sense to sell, we'll sell early. Um, if if the you know airport's delayed and and some of these projects are delayed, we're going to want to stay there until until you know the jobs are there, until these huge warehouses and industries are built. So it's just really broad, but it's because I I'm relying on Leah and her team to tell us when the right time would be to sell. And I'll tell you, like, part of it for me, the biggest piece is appreciation, how much the values go up. You know, right now, Denison's going up like crazy. Sherman's going up like crazy. Uh, we really can't even negotiate with our builders right now, all of our off-market stuff, because they just, they won't budge. We're up 20,000 over where we were even six or seven months ago. And so that's what we want, right? The cash flow is great, and cash flow during the interim is fantastic, but it's that price growth and that forced appreciation by getting them below market value. That's where the big exit comes into play. So if we're seeing... You know, we had a year at 20 and 30 percent, actually two. And so if we get back into that, I'm going to ride that for all it's worth, but also be cognizant that if we get into a situation where we think things could turn, that we have the flexibility to sell at that point. So anything we sell after year three is paid out. It's not reinvested. Great. And again, I want to reiterate, these are cash purchase projections. My intention is to go leverage. I already have banks prepared to lend to us. I'm just waiting rates to come down a little bit. And of course, when you leverage, returns go up. If you've been listening to me any time in the last 10, 12 years, you know that, that that's my model. And so our goal is to refinance as soon as we can. And of course, then the returns go up. Yeah, and it wasn't the time. You know, the, the rates have been too high, but we really both agree that probably they're coming down. But we'll, we shall see. And the beauty is we don't, we don't have to. We don't want to. We're not mm -hmm. stuck in a situation where we've got to get financing. I've been in those situations. It's awful. Uh, especially if you can't get it and you need it. So the fact that we can get it if we want to, if it makes sense, or we just sit in cash, that's fine too. Yep. And if we do get it, then we'll go buy more, which means then things even go up more. So that's the mm. goal. So uh, it's simple, you know, <laughs> again, I've learned over the years, if you can, if you can't explain a syndication and the business plan to your 12 year old, then you probably shouldn't do it. Um, so this is really simple. Forced appreciation. Okay. You're 12. 12 year olds not gonna know what that is, but you're basically fixing and not flipping, fixing and holding, increasing the value of the property by improving it. And then collecting the cash flow from that and distributing the profits over time. So again, just very simple, very simple kind of burr type strategy. Buy, renovate, refi, rent, something else. Refinance. Refinance, yeah, something like that. Yep. <laughs> It's a it's a burr fund. Okay. 
So again, the, the buy box is really clear. Um, it, there could be new homes if they make sense. Um, there's builders who are thrown in the towel and just can't finish their projects. And if, if Leah finds some great deals, we'll buy new homes. Previously renovated, properties needing renovation, predominantly single family or one to four unit multi. Diversified, again, you already know this, but we'll go over it. Diversified fund of residential rental properties, current cash flow and long-term appreciation, high growth markets of Texas, streamlined vertical integration of, of uh, company operations. I think this is the key. I think Leah, is, uh, Leah and her company are the reason that this is going to work because the overhead is so much lower because it's all under one umbrella. You know, they manage the properties, they have the teams to renovate, they've got the acquisition teams. So we're not trying to hire different contractors to, to get this done. It's all in-house and proven. And acquisition review, typical investment will have 5% uh, cash on cash or more, two bedrooms or more, 750 square feet or more, $1,200 in average monthly rent, and values from 150 to 280, and that would be the end value. Uh, as you heard, we're getting stuff for much cheaper and renovating it for much cheaper than these numbers, but this is what the end value would be of those properties. On the first year of operations, we already went over this, we will, we will consider getting debt when the numbers look better, when the rates are down. And the bank loves Leah. They they want her to to do this. They want to lend her more money. Um, they just have to come down on price, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my bank right now is at five nine nine. So we're we're getting closer. We're getting closer. Oh, that's good. Okay, so the minimum investment for accredited investors is fifty thousand dollars, which is fifty units. Uh, the total offering max is twenty million. Minimum raise is two million. We blew through that last fall. Deadline 120 days from published date with a 60 day extension and an offering closed date in nine months. So we're getting to a point where this offering is going to be closed. If you've been on the fence, um, I wouldn't wait much longer because uh, it, it will be sold out. Um, accredited investors only. And um, let's see. So how is the how is the capital then? Uh, there we go. Distri distributed. Amount equal to 100% of capital is returned to the investors first, then 75% of company profits to investor members, pro rata, and 25% of remaining company profits to manager. So it's a 75-25 split with capital uh, returned first. All distri distributions are made at the manager's sole discretion after expenses, fees, and allowing for any reasonable reserves. Investor distributions are paid pro rata, the manager expects to provide quarterly distributions starting two calendar quarters after funds are deployed by purchasing real estate assets. <clears throat> in order to give preference to early investors, each investor member will start sharing in profits after it's uh, that person has been a member for two calendar quarters. Manager fees are such that the manager will be in, uh, reimbursed for expenses. Annual asset management fee of 1.5%. Acquisition fee of 4% of the total purchase price of each asset. This is higher than a normal acquisition fee. I definitely want you to never invest in something where there's a 4% acquisition fee. But the way that our underwriter uh, found it the easiest way to, um, uh, to account for the renovation part of it and the time and the effort of renovating was put in the acquisition fee. So it's not really an acquisition fee. It's an acquisition and renovation fee, and that's why it's higher. But remember, these are really, really cheap properties, so it's it's not a lot of money um, considering the effort and time that goes into find these deals and renovate them. So that's basically instead of paying someone like me 20% of the rehab to oversee it, uh, we just agreed to do it for a very low fee because, again, it's it's vertically integrated. Disposition fee of 1.5% on the sale. And if financing is obtained, the refinance fee is of 1% on the principal amount of the loan. The guarantor on the refinancing of the portfolio may receive a fee up to 2% of the principal loan amount to guarantee it. And um, the marketing website platform fee of $25,250 per subscriber. The manager will receive 25% profits from the company. And here's the timeline. Again, capital raised three to nine months. Stabilize the portfolio, get it all renovated and rented. It's already 
well on its way, and then hold three to seven years. It's illiquid, meaning that you can't just say, hey, I want my money back. You're, you're in the fund. The, those funds have been used for purchasing and renovating, and so there's not just this pool of money to pay you back. You have to stay in for the full fund. Potential risks, uh, unknown if sufficient properties that fit the parameters would be available. That was a risk that is no longer a risk, at least not at this time. <laughs> um, limited geographic diversity, uh, as all properties will be in North Texas, but as you saw, they're spread out. It's illiquid. So if you're in a situation where you need your money, you're just gonna have to wait till the fund closes. Changes in market conditions such that homes do not appreciate as anticipated. Uh, and that would be that all these companies who've already allocated billions of dollars to build their headquarters decide to just pick up and move those those buildings that they've already started building. So I see it as very unlikely, but anything can happen. And then reliance on key personnel. Um, and again, this is a lower risk than it would sound if, if Leah and I were on a bus together and something horrible happened um, and the two of us were removed, what would, hap what would happen to the fund? I'm, the rest of my team would take over and the rest of your team would take over. <laughs> yep, we have. But knock on wood, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> that's not gonna happen. We'll just remove that from the energy. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Reporting, uh, we we report on purchases and sales and refinances, key information about assets under management and locations, the status, quarterly unaudited financial statements, information reasonably necessary for the preparation of tax returns, including K-1s, and other such reporting as provided in the operating agreement. And Anne and Kathy, Anne Triplett and Kathy McBride, they've been with Real Wealth for a long time, so you probably know them. They've been in um, customer service for a long time. They really understand the process of filling out the PPM and the subscription agreement, which if it's your first time, it can be a little daunting. Anne has been an investor in many of our projects. She can walk you through it if you have any questions. And Kathy McBride has been helping investors for a long time with just navigating some of these things. Because it, it can be, again, if it's your first time investing in a fund, there's a lot of documents and uh, that can be that can feel overwhelming. So they are there to help you. All right. So with that, let's see if there's questions. I haven't. Texas is becoming less progressive through recent legislation. Won't populations decline as people, especially women, move away? That's a really tricky question to answer. That's pretty political. Um, what I can tell you is that I don't see any change in people relocating here. And you have to remember that the policies that are being enacted here in North Texas and in Texas are reflective of the population here in Texas and North Texas. And so I certainly don't want to make personal commentary on what has or hasn't passed here. All I can tell you is that what does go through our legislation does typically represent the feelings of the people here in North Texas. Uh, can we have a link to the slides? Absolutely. This will be uploaded at growdevelopments.com. When you, when you click on the uh, Invest Now tab, it'll take you to the, to the investor portal. I see the trend of return to work. How does it affect these markets? Really doesn't affect what we're doing because at the end of the day, we're targeting where there's already people working in facilities and working at employers. Uh, I think that the return to work is maybe gonna help the inner cities a little bit where vacancy and office space is like 50%. But again, we don't invest in office space. I feel it's too volatile. This is single family and small multifamily, one to four, one to eight family at most. So uh, really not an effect of what we're doing. Okay, uh, question, uh, are you putting in your own funds? Yes. Yes. Are there any 50,000 deals available uh, for if you're trying to buy outside the fund? Uh, Leah's just not going to take that risk with individual investors. Of course, you could, you could try to find things, but uh, the reason, I'll just speak for Leah and you can answer, but the reason that she's getting deals is she's super connected with wholesalers and they know that she's got the cash and she's got the knowledge and can make a decision really quickly. Uh, whereas, you know, an investor from out of state just wouldn't be able to do that. You have to be able to move like this. So for you to be calling an investor and say, do you like this one? And they got to do their due diligence, you, the, the deal's gone. 
So you you just you have to be able to make split second decisions like you did. <laughs> Fifty thousand, okay. I got the email. I said, hey, I got one, one twenty. I'm buying it, and I had it signed and money wired in three minutes. So uh, it's just a different way of doing business, but. You know, these $50,000 deals, these aren't MLS deals. These aren't on-market deals. These are people calling me who have a property they need to liquidate. Yeah, it would be pretty tough to do outside. Okay, 8% seems low. We think so too, but we would rather under-promise and over-deliver. So we're already blowing, like we said, we are already blowing out the numbers that we projected. But 8% is still good, especially in today's market. Believe me. It's better than being promised 14% and having a capital call because you can't refinance your notes, yeah. which is happening all over the place right now. Yeah. I don't understand how it works with distribution. You said the capital first and then only the interest. Can you give an example of how this would work? Yeah. So basically, whatever profit is left over goes all to you guys until capital is completely paid back and then the split begins. So Kathy and I are not getting paid outside of the asset management until you've been paid back in full. That was just something that we put in place to make it even more protective for the customer. What process does one go through to confirm accredited investor status? Very good question. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the you name of the company? Verify Investor is probably verify. the one. Yeah. I, I just had my CPA write a letter. Uh, again, it's a million in net worth or if the income qualifies. And so, you know, you can't use your personal home equity, but if you have bank accounts, if you have uh, investment properties, you have 401ks, there's all sorts of things that qualify. And so my CPA already had all my info and just typed up a letter. You can go to verifyinvestor.com and fill out the information and they can give you what's needed for that. It's a pretty simple process. It's just providing the documentation and getting the form. And because we filed this as a 506C, we're required to get verification from a CPA, a financial planner, an attorney, or verifyinvestor.com. So, you, you know, if you we can't verify it for you. Um, but when you go to verifyinvestor.com, you'll have a, they'll give you that confirmation and you can use it on different deals that you're doing for a period of time. Uh, and that, that's just how... That's just how crowdfunding works there. That's the protection of the investor, so, supposedly. I mean, they're basically saying, if you've got a lot of money, then you're qualified, <clears throat> which really isn't isn't true. But that's why we try to do so much education. And y'all forgive Kathy and I, we're both getting over being sick. <laughs> I'm still sick. I'm in the middle of it. Three-year-old like, grandchild for you. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've got the grandkid. You've got the little baby. And uh, they love they love germs. They love to bring germs home. But they're so cute that it's worth it. All right. Will our initial investment be it or can we be asked to contribute more? You can contribute more till it's closed, uh, which is a few more months. So you would want to get on that. But if you're asking, like, are we going to come to you for more money for something? No, we've already built reserves into this. Yeah, no capital calls. Uh, but you would just like it's not an open fund. Once it's closed, no more money coming in. I, I know people do these and people have tried to talk to me into them, but uh, it's easier to be a Ponzi scheme if you can keep taking money in and paying out investors with the new money. So I, I've always been told by my attorneys, just have it, have a closed date. And then that's just not an is issue if you're investing. I, I would be careful of those open-ended funds personally. Mm -hmm. Where are we now with the fund? Well, I think we answered a lot of that. We're using the money as fast as it comes in. So that's why yeah. we buy so much so quickly. Are self-directed IRA funds eligible? Yes. Yes. And is it subject to UBIT? I think you need to talk to your uh, CPA. Show Always show your CPA the documents because it's different for everybody. But I, my guess would be that if we finance that it would be, but that would be a different. Anyway, talk to your CPA. You might have to finance within the IRA itself to, to qualify for that. So I, I would talk to your CPA or your trust, yeah. company, whoever you use. Yep. Is there going to be a tour soon? There's one this weekend if you're mm -hmm. in town, uh, this weekend starting at 10? That... Yeah, 10 o'clock on Saturday. It'll be from 10 to 5 or 10 to 4. And then we have an update that Kathy and I are doing here in Dallas from 5 to 8. Yeah, as long as we're both better. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to spread germs. All right. What is the split between your company and Leah's company? Uh, that's just between us. Doesn't affect you. All right. 
Um, our, but yeah, our annual depreciation deduction, deductions pass through to the passive investors. Yeah, so this is a pass-through entity. So you would want to talk with your CPA about what you can and can't claim. Uh, given that we're doing a short-term hold, I don't intend to call segregate this. But, you know, again, anything can change at any time if the laws change. But I don't really see that happening right now. But yeah, it's a pass-through entity. So you would talk to your CPA about what you would be able to claim against your passive or active income. Okay, someone said, could you explain di diverse, uh, disbursements? I think we explained it well enough so that I'm not sure. But if we can always talk to you one-on-one -on -one if you if you want to understand that. But just to simplify, as cash flows come in, obviously the more homes we buy, they're for rent. That's cash flow coming in. What happens to the rental cash flow? Maybe that's what she's asking. Yeah, so all those profits left over after expenses are what is paid back to you as the investor until you're paid back in full. And then that's when Kathy and I begin to get our 25%. Okay. Can you invest with a self-directed 401k? I mean, I would think so, but again, talk to your advisor. Does the investor share in the appreciation gains? Absolutely. And the thing is, even if it doesn't appreciate for some re weird reason that $150,000 homes are the norm forever in Texas, <laughs> under this inflationary environment, let's just say that it never appreciates. It's it's already has built in equity, so that's great. But yes, when the properties sell, after you get your capital back, then it splits 75, 25, 75 to the investor. Yeah, so you guys get 75%, we get 25%, and that's split across everything, except up front until you get all of your capital payback. That's 100% to you. Does year three mean year three after the fund started or after the fund closes? So I don't anticipate that we're going to be selling these in three years. So I just want to be clear. Uh, most of what we're seeing with TI and Globotech and all this is just going to be started in two to three years. I put three to seven in there in case we had a problem child property I wanted to liquidate, or if maybe we had one in a city where I wanted to get rid of it for whatever reason, there could be there maybe a tornado goes through and destroys a bunch of neighborhoods. I mean, a hundred things could happen, but I intend to hold these five to seven years. That's my plan uh, because I want to be able to reap all the benefits of what's going to happen to Silicon Alley as all these companies come in. Uh, that said, it would be three years from the closure of the fund in my mind. Uh, but again, that's not, that's not my goal. My goal is not to be selling in three years. We all make money by sitting on them and letting them go up in value. Somebody asked if the return percentage changes with the market, and yes, we're 8% is the target uh, based on extremely conservative underwriting with, you know, we went to, to Leah and said, what do you think the typical cost of a property is that you're going to acquire? How much is it going to cost to renovate it? What is the buy box? Let's plug it in to how many properties we think we're going to buy and the costs associated and the cash flow and all that. We we put together an incredibly extensive um, spreadsheet with our very, very good underwriter to determine uh, what would be the most conservative return. Now, 8% is just that projected return based on that. If if it, it could be double that, you know, if, if things go wild and crazy, like we think they will, because what, what is the appreciation we anticipated in, in the uh, underwriting? We underwrote total appreciation over the whole term at almost the equity that we've gotten and what we've bought. That's what we underwrote. So I think and we Leah's, Leah was mad. She's like, do we have to be this conservative? But you know, we, I just, yeah, she was like, come on. So yes, if it's, if it does much better than we think it will, it could be double the April. It could be 16%. Yeah. I um, mean, at the end of the day, if we have one year at 30%, we've already doubled what we are at right now. So at the end of the day, I, I we wanted to be super conservative, guys. You have to understand, last June when we put this together, no one knew what was coming. No one knew what the Fed was going to do. No one knew how aggressive they were going to be. And so we wanted to make sure what we put out there, we were going to meet. And so obviously we were super conservative, but the numbers speak for themselves. And again, we underwrote it with such minimal appreciation over that term that, and of course, not with all this equity capture either. I didn't anticipate that I was going to have all the other people buying these properties out of the game where I was picking up houses I was paying 85 for on our projections for 80 and for 70 and for 50. So, you know, homes that I would have had to pay 110,000 for when there were tons of competitors buying with me that had cash and access, 
Now I'm getting those for $65,000, $70,000. So that's $30,000 like that. So again, extremely conservative underwriting. Yeah, and actually, uh, Lisa, who's our uh, kind of fund consultant, she's a former attorney and ran a syndication department. She's been an investor with a lot of our projects. That's how we, uh, how I met her. Uh, she is going to take the real, the the actual numbers and run it through the spreadsheet so we can get a better idea of what it really will be. But, um, but no, eight, it, it's a 75-25 split after you get your capital. So if there's a lot of money, you get 75% of it. You know, there's no cap. That's that's the nice thing. Yeah, we didn't write it where there's a cap where you only make up to 12% or whatever, and then that's it. It's we share. What kind of depreciation are you anticipating flowing back? Again, you just need to talk to your CPA. Yeah, yeah. so straight line depreciation on single families 27 and a half years. So you talk to your CPA and see how it's going to affect you through a pass down and flow through. And it does flow through. Yeah. Will this will disposition be bulk sale? No. So no, yeah. individually, so we are selling for top dollar. Most of these will go to owner occupants. And I own the sale firm all in house. So again, we can do some of them with tenants in place. A lot of hedge funds buy here, something like 70% of properties are going to investors in my market. So barring that changing, it's possible we can even sell these with tenants in place. So we will sell them individually for top dollar. If Jeff Bezos and his new single family rental fund wants to give us twice what it's worth, we'll take it. But <laughs> right, now, right now, that's not the plan. Uh, um, payments are paid quarterly. Mm -hmm. uh, someone said I was invest invested in another rental fund. Does this make me accredited? Um, uh, the SEC makes the rules. We don't. And the SEC definition for accredited is that you either make $200,000 as an individual or $300,000 if you're married and you expect, and you've done that for the last two years. That's one way to qualify. Another way is that you have a, a million dollar net worth. And another way is if you are have a, a Series 7 license or another financial planner license. Um, I would just go look up definition of accredited investor. You'll see that on the SEC website. We also have it on the Real Wealth website if you search there. Uh, but you will have to prove your accreditation through a third party. And like I said, that third party could be your CPA, it could be your attorney, uh, financial planner, or just go to verifyinvestor.com where they'll ask you to upload the documents, they'll verify it, and then send us a letter because we are required that, it's just required that you prove that you're accredited under this kind of filing. The SEC is just so strict about, about who can invest in these funds and it's really frustrating, honestly, but it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, when will the first distribution happen for an investor who joined and funded last year? About to happen. About to get it. Are the profits after recovery of principal reported on Schedule K-1 as interest, dividends, or capital gain? Uh, it's going to be a question for your CPA and for our CPA, but no, it, the, whatever the profit is, is a direct pass-through. Um, at this point in time, there is no principal or any of that because there's no loans. Now, once there's loans, then that's going to change because there'll be principal and interest payments that are going to apply towards that as well. Yeah, so it's not going to be interest because this isn't a loan. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's So there's going to be two types of income. There's the passive income from the cash flow and the, at the sale of properties when you sell, that's a capital gain. So they're going to be um, different kinds, but mostly it's going to be the, um, the, the cash flow income that you would get on any rental property until, until, until the date we sell. Uh, I may have missed it, but what are the typical property taxes for these single families? So most of these are really undervalued because they're infill. It's one of the reasons that we target them. So most of these homes are assessed at like 60, 70,000, way below value. Uh, and luckily, because we bought them after January 1st when the assessed date would have hit, they don't know they've even been renovated until next year. So uh, property taxes are, the percentage in this area is like 2.5 to 2.8 but I don't see any of these up at full value, which is great because it just means higher cash flow. Someone said, if I invest more funds, do I have to fill out the paperwork again for accredited investor st status? You shouldn't have to. The, the document that you presented is good for a certain amount of time. Um, so you would just want to check that. Uh, I think, what is it, six months maybe? Three months, six months? I'm not, I'm not sure. 
but yeah, reach out to them. And I mean, in reality, they've already got your packet and you might have to do some new paper with the new amount of money that you're bringing in. Yeah, you do have to fill out the subscription agreement again for the second round. When is the next tour after next weekend? We uh, we have a 12 month uh, tour date list that's gone out today. So if you reach out to your counselor at Real Wealth or if you send me an email, I can send you those dates. Does the investor share in refinancing? I think what this question hopefully means, because I'm, I'm gonna answer it. If we refinance, get all that cash and buy a bunch more properties, yes, you benefit because it's all part of the fund and you're one of the investors in the fund. Um, so yeah. It, but you when we refinance, it. we're not paying that back to principal or capital to you. We're using it to go buy more, to get more equity capture, more cash flow. Yep. Is there any cash flow distributed to investors or will I return be repaid? Yes, there'll be the cash flow along the way gets paid quarterly after fees. Are you reinvesting rental income to purchase no. new properties? No, the, the cash flow from the properties is distributed to the investors. But if we refi, that money would go to buy more properties. Okay. Wow, so many questions, you guys. I'll just do a few more. So I love questions, by the way. It means you're engaged and into it. I love it. So the change in return point. I'm on the parade, but I've got my radio show in just a few minutes. I oh my gosh, you can go and I can stay <laughs> on and, and do I'll, my I'll best. I'll stay another couple of minutes so that I'm, unfortunately, I'm going to have to jump off. I'm so sorry. I probably have something too that I probably need to get to, but we'll keep going. All right. Uh, so the change in return payout can be different each quarter. Yes. yes. Yeah. Because you're not you're you're not a lender. This is not uh, like Missy's fund where it was eight percent flat rate. This is uh, dependent on cash flow. Uh, if you're an investor, yeah, you can absolutely get. I think whether you're an investor or not, you can get a ledger of the properties. It's mm -hmm. part of the PPM now. Documents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh my gosh. Excuse me. I'm so sorry. If you do sell a house early, will you reinvest until the seven year mark? Until the third year. Um, anything after the third year is paid out to you guys. Anything before the third year, if we do sell one, which I don't see that happening, but if we do, then it would go be reinvested. Remember, the more that we reinvest, the better everybody does because of the equity capture piece. Every home we buy has equity capture, which increases the returns. That's why we want to buy as many as we can. That's that forced equity. Someone says, is there, can I still invest 50,000? Yes, it's still open uh, for a little bit longer. So you want to check out growdevelopments.com to sign up. And there's all kinds of information there. This webinar will be there, plus past webinars as well. Okay, do new investors earn at the end of the second quarter or the third? So it's two quarters after you join. So like if you joined right now, I think the first payout's in June, so your payout would be in December. Okay, what's the LTV ratio if we do get a loan? Uh, it's gonna depend on what the most advantageous terms are. I'm thinking it's probably gonna be 70 or 75, but it's gonna be wherever the best rate is that makes the most sense, it still allows us to go buy a lot more property. Uh, that will be one of the things that we're kind of waiting for and seeing where things lined up. But uh, it's the same model that I've done for my own personal portfolio. And generally what we do is 70 or 75. Would the fund, fund extend beyond seven years? No, I see no world where that would happen. Okay. All right, y'all. I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to jump off, but thank okay. you so much. And you thank guys you. don't have to email me if you need anything at all. Okay. See you this Thanks. weekend, hopefully. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You too. All right. Can we invest through a self-direct IRA? Yes. Uh, can we get hit with phantom income? Um, that could be possible if we sell properties within the fund, because if that if if the properties are reinvested and there was profit, then yes, you would get phantom income. But like Leah said, she just doesn't think that there'd be any reason to sell anything that we've bought because it, the, it's been so good. She's so happy with the purchases. Phantom income, for those of you who don't know, it's like for our development projects, the business plan has been to build houses, sell those houses, take that money and b build more houses, sell those houses, take that money. So every time that a house is built and there's profit, that profit flows down to the investor, even though you haven't got your money back because it's gone into reinvesting. So it's just ugly thing really 
uh, it's important for you to know that it can happen within a fund. So that's one of the reasons we don't expect to be sort of flipping properties within the fund uh, so that you're not you know, hit with that. And the difference with this also is that you're getting cash flow along the way. So even if there was a property that we're like, we just hate this property, you want to sell it, uh, you, you've got cash flow coming in from the fund that would help pay for that. If the investor invests the minimum 50K and later wants to add more, is there a minimum amount on the added investment? I don't think so. No, because you already put your minimum in. Okay, all right, everybody. Well, I'm going to wrap up too. Thank you so much for joining. You can always uh, reach out to us at syndications. Let me go back to this slide if I can. Can't anyway. Syndications at growdevelopments.com. Reach out to Ann or KMAC. We'll make sure to answer your questions as soon as we can. Have a great day, everyone. Talk to you soon. Bye bye.